Hi, I'm Caitlin here at Imagination Station, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about the sun and sunlight. So I have a special item here with me. Check out these beads and watch what happens as they're exposed to the sun's light. Do you see those changes? These beads have a special pigment inside that is reacting to the UV light, that's ultraviolet light from the sun. We associate the sun with warm summer days and even photosynthesis, but the light responsible for that is visible light, the light that helps us to see all around us. But there's another type of light radiating from the sun and that is ultraviolet light. Luckily, we have a way to protect ourselves from it using sunscreen. Watch what happens when I expose these beads, but I protect one of them with sunscreen. Cover them back up for a few seconds and we'll see how they change. Now, when you're picking out a sunscreen, you wanna pick one that has both broad spectrum on the label and a high SPF. SPF stands for sun protecting factors. And that is going to actually block the sun, react with that UV light and protect your skin from all kinds of damage, from tans to aging and even links to cancer. All right, let's check out our beads. You can see that the beads that were protected by sunscreen are reacting much slower than the beads that were not protected by sunscreen. And in the same way, our skin is protected when we cover it with sunscreen. And you should always remember to reapply early and often. These solar beads make a great tool for demonstrating how sunscreen works, but they also can make a great reminder for when you should be wearing sunscreen. Grab a few solar beads, a pipe cleaner, and you can make yourself a fun solar bracelet. When you see your beads changing color, you should be wearing sunscreen. So remember, the next time you're out enjoying a warm, sunny day, it's important to remember to protect your skin from the sun's ultraviolet rays. As part of our solar celebration, we are here with Dr. Laura McGaff from the Apple Planetarium at Lourdes University here in Toledo, mm -hmm. and we've just got a bunch of questions for you about the sun. Our favorite star. So I thought we would start with just like some, some basic measurements, some basic data about the sun. Like how, how big is the sun? Is, how can we like wrap our head around this enormous thing in the sky? Good question, because we've all looked up in the sky and we have a pretty good idea how much of the sky is covered by the sun. But let's think about the sun compared to an object that we're much more comfortable with, say, a basketball. So if I were to take our sun and shrink the whole sun down to the size of a basketball, how big do you think the Earth would be? And I'll give you a hint, the Earth is smaller than the sun. So show me with your hands, how big do you think the Earth would be if the sun was this big? I'm going to say maybe something on the size of like a green pea or a little bit smaller. Well, let me tell you, if you look really closely at a basketball, you see it has bumps on the surface. The Earth would have actually be slightly smaller than one of the bumps. Wow. So let's imagine then that I could say pluck one of those bumps off the surface of the basketball. So I've got the sun here and the Earth here. How far apart do you think they actually would be at this scale? That scale. 93 million miles in reality, but in that scale. If I just hold my hands out on the, in either direction. Okay, maybe the length of my bed. Maybe bigger than the length of your house. Well, if I set this basketball at one end of a tennis court and the earth at the other end of the basket, at the other end of the tennis court, it's still not quite far. It's more like putting this at home base and the earth at its first base on a, on a full baseball diamond. So the earth is actually really small compared to what the sun and really far away, 93 million miles. Wow, that's a nice scale the way to think of things with the basketball like that. But uh, what, what is the sun made of? So the sun is, um, is made of, and like all stars, it's plasma, which is superheated hot gas. Gas that's so hot that even the electrons just pop off of the, the atoms. So it's a mixture of supercharged particles. Um, plasma doesn't usually occur here on Earth. The few times that you do get it would be inside a super hot 
fire or inside a lightning bolt. I know we've I've, we've talked about things or heard things in the news about like solar flares and things like this, like stuff coming off the sun. Um, does that ever affect us here on Earth? Other than it, you know, it, it may look interesting if you're looking through a telescope or something like that. So, there, so yes, there is this. So stuff does come off of the sun all the time. A stream, steady stream of particles that we call the solar wind. And the solar wind is always blowing, and it blows from the sun out and into every direction in space. Sometimes that solar wind is pointed toward us here on Earth, and those are the times that we're more likely to, say, have the northern light or a borealis. But it can also affect us in other ways. It can also interfere with your cell phone reception. Um, and also realize that things that we send out into space, like the satellites that our cell phones rely on, or astronauts on the International Space Station, they're going to be affected by the solar wind as well. Um, as we look forward to sending people to, say, the moon or Mars, they're going to have to contend with solar weather. A question from like a six-year-old is, what would happen here on Earth if somehow, magically or non-scientifically, the sun just literally disappeared? What would happen if you could just suddenly Take away the sun, uh, life here on Earth would be really different. It would get so cold, first off. Uh, we rely on the sun to keep us warm. And, we, and so we would be really cold. We wouldn't have any daytime. It would be night all the time. There wouldn't be any moonlight because the moonlight is actually sunlight that's reflected off of the moon and down to Earth. So it would be cold and dark, our uh, plants would die, and life just would not be the same. You know, when you, when you see photos from NASA of the sun, a lot of times they, they don't look like the classic yellow sun that we draw when we're doing paintings or, you know, whatever. Uh, if, if you were to go out into space, what, what color would our star appear? So what color is the sun is actually something that people have seriously talked about. Uh, because also the color that we see the sun is going to be affected by our atmosphere. There's, so if you could leave Earth and be in a spaceship and have a way to look at the sun safely, you'd probably see it as a point of white light because that's uh, the, con the, the sun's giving off light in many different colors. Uh, not all of those colors our eyes can see. So the sun's giving off x-rays. It's giving off ultraviolet light. We can only see the colors of the rainbow. And when those are combined, we see it, we perceive that as white light. But the sun's giving off light of so, in so many other additional wavelengths that when NASA takes those pictures, it's using cameras that are specifically designed to see particular wavelengths of light. And to make it easy, NASA tends to color them uh, in, in certain, uh, give them certain colors that we can associate uh, with a particular, uh, a, a, we can, so that we can associate a particular color with a particular wavelength. So that we, you can look at for, uh, up pictures of the sun that may be green or orange or blue or purple. And those are really just artificially translated from one wavelength into a wavelength of light that our eyes can see. Is there, is there one thing that we should all know about the sun? What, what's, what's the one thing we should know? So my favorite, there's actually more than one thing I want everybody to know about the sun. First, it is a star. And that may seem surprising to some people. They don't really, th we think of, tend to think of stars as these bright lights we see at night. But the sun is just like those. And there's really just one thing that's special about the sun. Only one thing that makes the sun unique. And that is that it's close to Earth. There's lots of other stars out there that are so much like the sun, but they're just so much farther away that we don't experience their heat and light in the same way. And finally, the sun is always shining. So no matter what it's like where you are, no matter whether it's raining outside or it's nighttime, the sun is still shining. 
It's just whether we can actually see that sunshine or not. Okay. Uh, is there any danger of the sun burning out anytime soon? Not, the sun will eventually run out of fuel. That process of fusion, where two atoms are fusing into becoming another one, well, eventually the sun will run out of fuel, and that's gonna happen in a couple billion years, so we've got a few other things to worry about. But when that happens, the sun will change. The sun will first get slightly hotter, and that means that all of the water we have here on Earth is going to evaporate. We are not gonna to wanna to live here when all of our oceans and lakes have, have evaporated, but that will eventually happen. And after that, the sun will start to get bigger. It will actually take up more space until it envelops Mercury, Venus, and Earth. So Earth will eventually become part of the sun, and then the sun will collapse again and will end up as a dwarf, it'll end up as a dwarf star. But we've got a lot of other things that are gonna happen before that. So no danger to, of it becoming a black hole? <laughs> no, the Earth, the, the sun is too small to actually become a black hole. Um, that, only, that only happens to the biggest of stars. When the biggest stars run out of fuel, they collapse and form a black hole. So, so the sun overall is a fairly ordinary star, and, but it's very special to us because it's the one that gives us our, our, our heat and light that we need to live. But as we look out at the, all of the stars out in the night sky, if you go out and look at this, the starry sky, one out of every two stars out there has a, at least one planet going around it. So there are, maybe there are other worlds that have this, a similar distance to their sun or to their star and have similar conditions to, us, to life, to what we have here on Earth. So the idea of our, our sun is not unique. Earth might, we don't know if it's unique or, yet or not because we're just at the point of being able to detect these planets going around other stars in our galaxy. And in our galaxy, there's a couple hundred billion stars, and beyond the Milky Way, there's billions of other galaxies. So there's a lot of other planets out there. So our sun is very special to us because we've got a habitable planet going around it. There's a lot of, there's, we now know of thousands of other planets going around, other stars, just in our corner of the Milky Way. Will we find another place that it would be like Earth that we could go and live? We don't know, we're, just, we're still looking. But it's, that's one of the most exciting areas of, of astronomy right now, is looking for other Earths. Greetings, Dan here with Imagination Station, and I'm here to talk to you about the sun and its gravity. To do so, we're gonna use this, a gravity well. During the early stages of our solar system, there was all kinds of dust and particles just floating out in space. And over time, millions and billions of years, those tiny dust particles were drawn together by gravity. And eventually, enough of that mass was drawn together in one place to form a star. And that star became our sun. This metal ball is going to represent our sun. When I put it into the gravity well, it makes a big divot that represents the immense amount of gravity that the sun has on our solar system. Now, if I orbit planets around our sun, you can see that they get trapped in the orbit and they orbit in a mostly circular pattern. The planets that are further away rotate slower, like Jupiter and Saturn, while planets that are closer to the sun orbit the sun much, much faster. And most of our planets orbit in a circular pattern, but some things that orbit our sun, like comets, orbit in what's called an elliptical orbit. So they come further out 
away from the sun, and once they get closer to the sun, they go much, much faster. And when they get further away, they slow down, and they go faster and slower, just like a comet orbiting our sun. Our planets haven't always orbited the sun in that nice, regular fashion like they do now. In the early parts of the solar system, planets and other objects were orbiting the sun in a wild fashion, going many different directions. And eventually, over time, those objects collided with each other, float into the sun or out of the solar system, and eventually they all got to this regular orbit, all going the same direction, the orbits of the planets that we see today. Thank you so much for joining me today and talking about the sun and its gravity. Okay, we are here with Dr. Randy Ellingson, a professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy and a faculty member at Wright Center for Photovoltaic Innovation and Commercialization. So we're happy to have you here today um, as part of our solar celebration. And we want to know about solar panels and some of the research you do. So what, what is your, your focus of your research? Um, well, first of all, I am part of um, a pretty big team at the University of Toledo, and we work very collaboratively. So when I describe the focus of my research in, in almost all cases, it, it involves working with, with other people because uh, solar cell technology is um, somewhat simple in its idea, but it is fairly complicated to, um, to, 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 to create and to understand completely. And so um, my research, um, well, let me just say our research at the University of Toledo more broadly is to study uh, what we refer to as thin film photovoltaics. Photo meaning light and voltaic meaning electricity. Um, photovoltaic solar cells convert sunlight uh, directly to electricity. So they're very different from uh, other types of uh, power plants, if you will, that all rely or that, that mainly rely on um, creating motion, um, much like, uh, you know, running a, a turbine generator. Um, that's how hydropower works at a, 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 you know, at a dam, and that's how wind turbines work. And that's actually also how power plants that run on fossil fuels and nuclear energy work. When they're generating electricity, they're using thermal energy to generate steam that drives a turbine that then um, is coupled to a generator that, that outputs electricity. A solar panel um, can be perfectly quiet, motionless uh, to, the, to the observer. And when you shine light on it, it is a power plant, it generates power. So um, we are working on thin film solar cells, which is um, almost, it's almost true that it's everything other than silicon. And silicon um, is what you usually see if you're looking at a power plant. Now around here in Ohio and here in the United States, there are a lot of solar power plants that are based on a different type of technology that's not silicon and it's called cadmium telluride, um, CADTEL for short. And that's that happens to be the technology that is um, is manufactured by First Solar, um, whose uh, home as far as um, manufacturing and, and most of its research or a lot of its research is here in Perrysburg, Ohio. So, yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, so you, you mentioned um, the, the CADTEL, is that right? Yeah. And the silicon. What, why, why are there like, they're not like two competing, they're two different ways of making a solar cell. So what, what are the advantages or disadvantages of either yeah. or? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So from the, um, I mean, the, in reality, they are in competition in the marketplace. Um, um, if you look at, uh, if you look at a silicon based solar panel, what you will find is, if you look closely, what you will find is that there are a series of uh, cells that are approximately six inches square. Um, they are uh, aligned in an array um, with a, a glass encapsulation structure. And each of those solar cells will be wired to its neighbor. Um, 
And so there, there is this, um, there's this initial process that involves growing the silicon um, crystals in a large bool, six inch diameter cylinder that might be three feet tall, and then slicing it with a, 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 a like a wire, like a very fine diamond wire saw that creates a wafer that's maybe 150 microns thick. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that might be maybe five times the thickness of a human hair, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so um, those wafers need to be polished. They need to be processed to, to, to have the right electronic properties. Their surfaces need to be prepared very carefully. Um, and so that's that's one type of solar cell. That's silicon. It, it works well. Um, it, uh, it's uh, greater than 90% of what we refer to as the terrestrial market, which is the, the 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 type of technology that is installed here on the surface of the Earth for generating power. Um, cadmium telluride is very different. It um, it uh, does not require such a thick layer because it's a different type of semiconductor. It absorbs light more strongly than silicon does for a, a given thickness. And um, so the, the, the thicknesses of the so-called thin film, um, cadmium telluride, um, those light absorbing layers are only two microns or three microns or four microns thick, typically. And so um, when you look at how a cadmium telluride solar panel is made. Um, instead of creating individual cells and wiring them together using robotics, for example, um, the entire surface of a sheet of glass that used to be two feet by four feet, which is pretty big, and now is about four feet by six feet, which is quite large, um, can be coated all at once. Um, the, the Essentially, the glass rolls by a, a coater, and um, after the glass rolls by the coater on the assembly line. It has a coating of semiconductor material and um, there are many layers in these solar cells, but the semiconductor layer um, you know, is the principal one. Um, subsequently, through some processing, the solar panel can be um, divided into individual cells that will span uh, the entire width of the solar panel. And those solar cells, which are long and, and thin and go acrosswise, are then interconnected with each other um, through this uh, very elaborate and uh, you know um, highly refined manufacturing process that allows you to build up the current and the voltage in your solar panel the way you want to, and um, uh, and so. Um, the way these individual cells are made is actually with a laser, a very, uh, you know, highly focused laser beam that's highly controlled and, and actually cuts the semiconductor um, um, layer into these many cells. And so they're, they're very different manufacturing processes and um, uh, the approach to making the final product is very different because in one case you're forming the semiconductor light absorbing layer right there in real time in the factory. And in the, in the first case with silicon, you have to go through this, um, you know, energy intensive and time intensive growth process and then cut the wafers and, 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 and stack them up and get them all ready to go and then, you know, feed them into your machine. So very different. As you were describing that, I, I felt like it was almost a sales pitch for the cadmium telluride process because it sounded like the doing the, um, you know, creating the, growing the boule of this single crystal, cutting it, doing all that. It sounded like that is a, a more time or process intensive process than, I don't want to diminish it, but by just simply putting down a thin film on a, on a piece of glass. Right. So if, of course, if you can get someone from First Solar to, to talk to you, you'll get, um, uh, you know, the, the best information possible. But um, it's my understanding that uh, that um, you're, you're right. It, it is more um, time intensive and it is more energy intensive. And uh, based on um, based on analyses of the two products, um, the the uh, the what's called the energy payback time or the energy returned on energy invested um, is is better for cadmium telluride now it's a smaller fraction of the market um, silicon photovoltaics um, work they work very well um, 
Um, cadmium telluride works very well. Um, and, and you said that uh, your your language was interesting. You said that the silicon uh, has 90% of the terrestrial market. So do you make solar cells differently if we're going to put them on the space station versus if you're going to put them on the ground? Well, um, yeah, that's a good question. So the, the answer is um, yes. Um, solar cells that are made for outer space for use in orbit, for example, are different. And um, um, if you look back at the history of space photovoltaics, and I'm not an expert in space photovoltaics, but if you look back at the history of space photovoltaics, you'll see that there has been um, a real premium placed on um, launching the highest possible efficiency solar cells that you can build manufacture and that's because um, the the cost in terms of energy and money of putting solar cells in space is high because of the, their weight so you want this ratio of the power of the solar cell to the weight of the solar cell you want that ratio to be high you want lightweight high efficiency and so that it turns out has meant um, using some fairly elaborate photovoltaic technology that is um, in practice, too expensive for mass use um, uh, on the terrestrial um, terrain, let's say. Um, and that, uh, that consists of layering um, as many as three or experimentally even four or five different um, light absorbing layers um, that are designed to capture the solar spectrum, right, that goes from the ultraviolet all the way through the rainbow colors into the infrared. Um, these, these layers are designed to capture that sunlight more efficiently. But it was interesting, you mentioned that the efficiencies of some of the solar cells could be as high as 30%, which, is there some theoretical reason why it can't be 80%? Or do we just not know how to make the cells more efficient? Is there some the physics behind why, yeah, 30% is great because we're knocking on the door of, you know, that's the best we can ever get. Well, it is great. Um, and actually, so for a tandem solar cell, I'm, I, I seem, I, I'm trying to remember the number. I think that the, the peak theoretical efficiency is, is slightly over 40%. 40 um, and um, that number, by the way, depends on um, whether you're talking about the the sunlight as it appears on the surface of the earth or the sunlight as it appears above our atmosphere because they're a bit different in in their um you know uv and other content sure. their shape the shape of that spectrum changes a little bit but um the theoretical maximum conversion efficiency for a single junction or a single absorber solar cell is about 30 32 or 33 percent wow. and um, there are some real-world limitations that uh, determine that theoretically attainable number. Um, the highest anybody's gotten is around 30% with a, a single junction gallium arsenide. That's this group three, group five material. Um, and so, you know, uh, well, first of all, what are the losses that go into, uh, uh, you know, only getting 30% um, or 32% theoretically? Um, one of the big losses is actually transmission. So I described this band gap energy and there are no states in here. So photons that don't have enough energy, they go right through these materials, just like light going through visible light going through glass. So that's, um, that's some solar energy that we're not even absorbing. So we can't convert that. Um, the, the next largest source of loss in, for example, in a silicon solar cell or in a gallium arsenide solar cell is this, um, what I refer to as thermalization, where if you, if you absorb blue and green photons, you have, you generate a lot of excess electronic energy that then turns into heat right away. So, um, that heat is, is not electrical energy. So we don't measure that when we measure the power from the solar panel that can be about, um, in a silicon solar cell, that's almost half of the incident sunlight energy or power, if you will, um, is converted to heat. So um, and those are those that gives you some idea of what we're working on here. And 
Then if you go to these multi-junction solar cells that have you know, two or more different layers that absorb different colors of the solar spectrum, that improves your chances at making higher and higher efficiency solar photovoltaic technologies, um, but you're also introducing more interfaces where different materials meet each other. And you might have typically another layer in between those layers. And so as you add complexity, managing the behavior of these materials, not only for uh, you know, the, the ideal transmission of the, of the part of the solar spectrum that's not being absorbed and you don't want reflection, um, but also managing um, losses that can occur where these materials meet. Um, those are the kinds of challenges that you face when you're trying to make high, high efficiency tandem or triple junction solar cells. Is there anything else that we should know about uh, solar panels that, you know, um, stuff, like the one thing somebody on the street should know <laughs> about solar panels? Um, yes, I think that um, people should know that um, solar panels are now um, very arguably the most important way that we generate electricity. And um, if you look at the last three to five years, and certainly the next three to five years, most of our new power generating capacity in the United States is solar energy. So this is a, a very important technology. and. Um, I encourage people to learn about the basics of this technology. And uh, if you're interested more to get an education in this field, because this field is gonna be important for a long time. Um, it's been growing at uh, a rate of uh, well over 20 and closer to 30% for about two decades now. And um, while the growth is likely to slow down, uh, the growth is still very robust and um, 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 if you look at the, if you look at what's happening with uh, um, climate change and the accelerating, you know, concentration of carbon dioxide that results from um, burning coal and natural gas and um, oil and gasoline, uh, um, those contributions to our atmosphere are driving our climate to change. And solar energy from photovoltaic panels is, um, it's not. Um, a purely um, carbon-free energy, but once you have the panels made, it is a carbon-free energy, nearly carbon-free energy. There's a little bit of carbon that you associate with maintenance because you have to typically drive, you know, a truck out there. And um, so solar panels make a very low carbon energy and, uh, and there are, uh, you know, the job growth in this field is fantastic. And um, if you look across the United States, there are big disparities, big differences between how different states have uh, decided to adopt and support this technology. And um, there are states that are getting, uh, you know, certainly several states are getting on the order of 10% or more of their electricity from sunlight. And then there are other states where, um, you know, just a very, very small fraction is coming from sunlight. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you would think that the earth is probably intercepting an immense amount of solar energy, far more than, you know, if we capture, far more than we could ever probably utilize, correct? Um, that is correct. So I think the number that you're talking about is something like, um, we use about 20 terawatts of power. If you add up all of the different energy sources on earth, um, I think um, at least above the atmosphere, the incident solar energy is 175,000 terawatts or something like that. So okay. an enormous number. I should look that up. So, <laughs> yeah. so you should look that up. It's a, that is a tremendous amount of, of energy. Yeah. So, okay. All right. Well, you know, thank you so much for, you know, being part of our solar celebration. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. It was really interesting. A lot, a lot of thank cool science much. there. It'd be great to talk to you again um, about this and, and maybe when things open up, uh, um, you know, I'm not sure if you guys have a solar demo for, for kids, but I'd love to be part of that. And um, I'll just mention also that uh, with the help of some students and some other people in the community, um, 
we have started a nonprofit here in Toledo called Glass City Community Solar. Um, and our goal is to install solar arrays that benefit the low income community. So we're trying to really rev up the solar um, uh, industry, not, you know, um, practically speaking here in Toledo. Wind. Wind is air that is moving. Wind is what makes the leaves blow on the trees, my pinwheel spin, even flags billow in the air. All of that is caused by air moving from one place to another. But why does the air move around? Well, it moves because of the energy from the sun. When air gets warmed up, it moves. To show you this, I have something called a solar balloon. It's this great big bag that I'm gonna fill with air and we're gonna see what happens when it warms up in this beautiful sunny day. Let's go. <laughs> all right. Now all I have to do is tie this close, tie a string to it, and we'll see what happens as the air warms up from the sun. Energy from the sun excites the molecules inside of the solar bag, causing them to expand, making them less dense than the surrounding air, which allows our solar bag to float. Similar to wearing a dark colored shirt or getting into a dark colored car on a warm summer's day, the black color of our solar bag causes more of the sun's energy to be absorbed and heats up the air inside faster than the air surrounding it. You can see as the energy from the sun warms up the air inside of this black solar balloon, it gets warmer and it rises up above the colder air outside of the balloon. This movement of air up and down is what causes the wind. 